So chapter 17, starting at verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. On this desperately sad Sunday, with news of the death of Richard, we have words from God in the transfiguration concerning the Lord Jesus that I hope will be of deepest comfort and assurance. With the vision of the transfiguration of Jesus, how he will come in his future glory on that great day of the resurrection, we are given a glimpse of the glory that awaits every one of his faithful disciples And Richard, without any doubt, was one such. And so the corner of the curtain of eternity is lifted at the transfiguration. The master's true dignity is unveiled at the transfiguration. We are granted a glimpse of the good things yet to come at the transfiguration. In this world, we're reminded so frequently of the tribulations and weaknesses, the battles and conflicts of our own lives, and it's so easy to take our eyes off the future reward and the good things to come. But here, in this brief incident, we're shown the Lord Jesus in all his glory. And here we see with him Moses and Elijah beyond the grave. One's been dead for 1,400, another for 900 years, yet they're alive with the Lord. This comment from the 19th century. There is no such thing as annihilation. All that have ever fallen asleep in Jesus, however that may have come about, will be found in safekeeping. Patriarchs and prophets, apostles and martyrs, down to the humblest servant of God in our day. And so on what is a desperately sad Sunday with news of Richard's death, we have words from God concerning the Lord Jesus that I trust will be of deep comfort and assurance for all. Right at the heart of this account is the voice from heaven. The cloud descends, the voice speaks, And the cloud lifts, and when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And so the Lord Jesus is front and center in this revelation. And the voice makes that clear. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I spoke on this passage one time in Cambridge University. I asked the gathering of undergraduates to consider how many words they heard in any given week, and they literally 
rolled on their chairs with laughter. We newscast and podcast and upload and download. We tweet and blog, text and message. We have news feeds, apps and Instagrams. We are tuned in and linked in. How many words do you think we hear in any given week? How many words do you read? How many do you speak? First, I'd like us to see that in the transfiguration, the, just the experience of the transfiguration, we are shown that we should listen. The vision itself shows that we should listen. And so the mountain is significant. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So many of the key moments in the history of God's people take place in such a setting. Mount Moriah, Abraham and Isaac, Mount Sinai, Moses and the Covenant, Mount Abel, Joshua and God's people, the Temple Mount, Revelation and Reconciliation. The prophets speak of the mountain of God, the mountain of the Lord being lifted up, raised up above all mountains. The Psalms have the same, the Sermon on the Mount. So that it is a mountain, I think, is significant. I say the vision is significant, and I say vision, it's probably the wrong word. It's no mirage or dream or hallucination even. It is a transfiguration. The Greek word is the word from which we get our word metamorphosis. It's a genuine transformation. The Lord Jesus is transfigured, and we see him in his glory. And so the second verse He was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Remember, we've just heard that he will suffer, die, and rise. He's just told us that there are some standing there who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his glory. And here we are shown Jesus, and here we see Jesus, and this Jesus is transfigured. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light. Ezekiel saw a likeness with human appearance, and upward from his waist it was as gleaming metal. Daniel saw one like a son of man. David spoke of the son of man, whom the Lord has made strong for himself. And here we have the son of man in all his glory. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light the mountain, the vision. And then the presence of Moses and Elijah, that has to be significant. Verse 3, behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Uh, God had promised a prophet like Moses who had come to lead his people. We are told that Elijah must come. The disciples refer to this at the end of the reading. Elijah was the great prophet of reformation and restoration, and Moses led the people of Israel through the Exodus, the great man of redemption. So together, with Moses and Elijah together, we have the representative figures of the law and the prophets. We have the founding fathers of Israel. We have the long-awaited, in a sense. They are the Elizabeth I and the Winston Churchill of a nation. The presence of Moses and Elijah is significant. And then the bright cloud in verse 5 must be significant. Peter said, Lord, it's good we're here. If you wish, we'll make three tents. As he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And in the Exodus, the cloud led the people symbolizing God's presence. And on the mountain, when the law was given in the tabernacle and at the temple, the cloud descended, symbolizing God's presence. And there's the glory cloud in Ezekiel, symbolizing God's presence. And so the whole transfiguration experience clamors for us to listen. The mountain, the transfiguration, Moses and Elijah, the glory cloud. I guess we seek to emulate emulate this kind of public relations exercise, except this is just with three people. In our small kind of way, we kind of try to do it. Apple do it, don't they? Uh, A great show, huge anticipation, the iPhone 397, or whatever it happens to be, a virtual reality headset. 
The Olympic Committee did it. You remember, we were all on the edge of our seats, waiting, listening. The Ashes series, some of us will be tuned in. There's nothing like this. And Peter reflects on it. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. 2 Peter chapter 1. Are we listening? On its own, the vision is, or the transfiguration, just as a visual experience, it's not adequate. It's often said that a picture paints a thousand words. The trouble is, pictures alone can mean anything. A picture can yield a thousand meanings. For clarity, words are required. Words bring definition, and words bring precision. And I know you'll be saying, yeah, but what you say can mean one thing to me and one thing to somebody else. But actually, when you put words in their context and when words are chosen with meticulous care and when you can cross-check, when you can cross-check the context, then words have real precision. One writer describes verse 5 as the high point of the narrative. And Peter certainly saw it like that. We heard the voice born from heaven. In Mark, we're told that the visual experience itself left the disciples terrified. Are we surprised? And Peter blurts out from his position of terror kind of the first thing that comes into his head. Uh, Lord, it's great that we're here. Let's make three tents. I, I was with Phil and Ermin Desmond, who will be listening to this now earlier this week and their son Ben was there and we read this passage together because we were going to be looking at it on Sunday morning and Ben, suggest, ben suggested that um, uh, Peter must be su suffering from, I think he called it something like celebrity or brain sca scramble or something like that. You know how it is and I, I, I was reminded of a, a friend who met uh, somebody they were really in awe of and the guy asked them their name, and their main name went completely blank, and they weren't able to say it. And it's kind of a moment like that. The cloud descends, the voice speaks, this is my son, listen. But when the cloud lifts, they saw Jesus, no one but Jesus, Jesus only. And God speaks audibly from heaven like this on only three occasions in the Gospels. And there are 14 words, 12 in the original, and they are laden with meaning. And the first word must be instructive, mustn't it? You know, as the cloud covers Moses and Elijah, as Peter has just offered to build three equivalent tents, as the cloud lifts, <laughs> they saw no one but Jesus only. And I think that helps to emphasize the, the failure of Peter, who has just declared, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and now, shall we bring th three equivalent tents for you? No, this is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Is that how it was said? But then the phrase, my son, is key. Israel in the Old Testament is described as God's son. Supremely, God's Messiah, the king, is called my son by God. We read Psalm 2 earlier, I think. Did we read Psalm 2 earlier together? You are my son. Today I have begotten you. The Psalm 2 phrase, you are my son, becomes a title, the son of God. And the son of God refers to God's eternal king before whom every knee will bow to whom God gives the nations as his heritage. And the Son of Man and the Son of God are equivalent references for the one to whom every nation will pay homage, all knees will bow, who will hold every man, woman, and child to account. So you have the visual experience, and then you have the cloud descending, and then you have these words, which on their own surely would cause us to sit up and listen. And then you have the title. Now, this is my son. 
the Christ, the rock on whom the church will be built. But then Isaiah, then the phrase is again chosen with acute care by God. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. It is actually closest to a quote from Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. This is my chosen son with whom I am well pleased. And in this first section of the second part of the great prophecy of Isaiah, God promises a servant who will be his child, who will suffer, die, and rise, who will carry God's judgment at all our human rebellion and failure and sin, who will be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, upon whom will be laid the sins of us all. And so this statement in the context of our chapter where Jesus has just declared that he must go to Jerusalem and he must suffer many things, well, it carries particular weight. This is my son. This is the Christ, Psalm 2. This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased, Isaiah 42, the suffering servant who will carry God's judgment at sin. And then there's that final word, beloved, which is intriguing because it doesn't actually appear in Isaiah 42. Surely the word is deliberately spoken by God to remind us of God's request to Abraham on a different mountain upon which the temple in Jerusalem was built, where God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, this is my beloved son. And on Mount Moriah, the Mount of Provision, God provided the Jehovah Jireh God a sacrifice for sin, which became Mount Moriah, the place where the temple was built and sacrifices for sin were made. And in the context then of Jesus' announcement that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer and rise, and Peter's refusal to take it. And then Jesus' rebuke, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. Are we listening? I mean, we listen to so much, don't we? You know, we listen to the CEO. He sends a message from headquarters. We'll read and listen to that. We listen to the head teacher on school reports day. What did they have to say? We'll read that. Or to the consultant as our results come back. Or, or we listen to the WhatsApp notice, ping, there's another wicket. Let's hope so. I hope yours isn't on. We listen to the news posted on the school's notice board on results day. We'll be listening then. Last September, I can tell you precisely where I was when I heard the news. Evan Davis announced it on PM, Queen Elizabeth II. I was listening. We all listened. And here is a preview of the transcendent, ascended, glorious Jesus Christ, the crucified, resurrected Son. Here is God's Son, before whom every knee will bow. Here is the long-promised suffering servant, the only Son, the Son whom God loved. This is my son, my beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So the vision, that we should listen, the voice, why we should listen, the context. Now, what should we listen to? That's a good question, isn't it? What is it in particular? Is this a kind of generalized, where well, we should take everything Jesus has to say with particular care. Of course, that must be so. The Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. The Mission of the Church, chapter 10. The Growth of the Kingdom, chapter 13. The Value of Each and Every Disciple, one by one, chapter 18. The Future Return of Jesus in Judgment, chapters 20, 20, 24 and 25. Of course, we should listen to his teaching, yeah, but is there more precision than that? 
Well, these words spoken by God from heaven are spoken in a particular context, and the transfiguration takes place within a setting and before a specifically chosen three, Peter, James, and John. Peter, who declared, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and to whom Jesus said, you are Peter, and on this declaration I will build my church. So remember, one, Peter has only just immediately declared that Jesus is the Christ. Remember, Jesus has only just declared Simon to Simon that he is Peter and that he will build his church on this declaration that Jesus is the Christ. Remember, Jesus has just announced that the Christ must suffer many things. Remember, Peter rebuked Jesus for saying that he must suffer. He dared to do such a thing. And remember that Jesus has only just told Peter that to suggest that his sacrificial death on the cross to carry the sins of humanity is not at the heart of his identity and his mission is satanic. Remember that Jesus has just announced that if anyone is to come after him, they must take up their cross, deny themselves, lose their lives, suffer with him. Remember that Jesus has declared that he will come as the Son of Man to judge the living and the dead. And so we can conclude. It'll be a slightly longer conclusion than usual, but we can conclude. And I think there are five things that we conclude. Conclu- conclude first about the church, that the rock on which the church is to be built is the rock of the king who suffered and died at the hands of sinful men and women to carry God's judgment at our rebellion. Remove the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Seek to deny the penal substitution of God's king as the suffering servant who is the God-provided sin sacrifice for the sins of men and women so that we can have the keys to heaven, if you like, to enter. Remove that. It's not only satanic to remove that from your gospel. It is also an act of gross disobedience to the God who has shown us Jesus Christ and told us to listen to him who insists that his death and resurrection is essential. And if you like, the key part to him being the Christ. Any form of so-called Christian gospel that downplays or denies or removes the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, oh, it's not only satanic, it's grossly disobedient to the God who tells us to listen to Jesus when he tells us precisely that. One. Two. God. That the Lord God of heaven glorifies this King Jesus who is prepared to suffer selflessly and sacrificially at the hands of sinful men. That this is the point of glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Here in heaven is the thing that is and will be center stage, lauded and rewarded, praised and promoted, the selfless, servant-hearted suffering of Jesus Christ. The transfiguration could have happened at any point in the gospel. Have you ever thought about that? It could have happened when Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. Would have been a very good place to put it, to have done it, if you like. This is my son, my beloved. Listen. It could have happened when Jesus healed dozens at a time. It could have happened when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. What a great time for the transfiguration. This moment of glory, this is my son, could have happened then. It could have happened when he fed 5,000 and when he did it again. That wouldn't have been a bad time for the transfiguration. But God chose to show the disciples the transfigured Lord Jesus Christ 
as he speaks about his suffering and his death and his sacrifice, which reveals the very character of God to us, and which is the thing that will be glorified in heaven, that we have a God who is selfless, who is prepared to suffer for us, who is servant-hearted. What, what will be in, in the spotlight in heaven is the service of the Lord Jesus, his sacrifice. This is the very essence of the God who we follow. This is the point of the transfiguration at this point. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. With him I'm well pleased. So it shows us something about the church, doesn't it? It shows us something about the God we serve. It shows us something about discipleship. Now, are we listening? I hope we're listening. That selfless suffering and sacrificial service are central to Christian discipleship. I mean, it would be weird if they weren't. Given that God has shown himself to be the God who serves selflessly, sacrificially, would it not be bizarre if subsequently then to follow him, when that's the thing he glories in, to follow him, it was actually all about me in a life of health, wealth, pleasure, and privilege? It would be absurd. But given that the transfiguration happens here, immediately after Jesus has just said, if anyone won't come after me, let him deny self, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, what we are to listen to surely is that Christian discipleship is walking in the footsteps of the one who served selflessly, sacrificially, and suffered. And the disciples find this so hard. You know, within minutes, Lord, who is the greatest? <laughs> within days, Lord, grant that these two sons, one will sit on your left, one on your right. Within hours, they'll be squabbling about who's going to be the kingpin and who's going to get the biggest reward now. I would suggest that if we cannot identify areas of sacrifice and selfless service, we have to wonder if we really know God at all or are following Jesus Christ. And this, I think, should make us embrace whatever in our personal circumstances a God's particular sacrifice for us and to see that actually that's what is part of the honors list and the medals table in eternity. Fourth, that he will return in judgment. Verse 27 of chapter 16, the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father and then he will repay each person according to what he's done. That this is a vision, a foretaste, the transfiguration of the risen Son of Man. He is the Son of Man, the Son of God. The Son of God is the suffering servant, and the suffering servant is the sacrificial lamb, and the sacrificial lamb is the risen king, and the risen, transfigured, ascended, enthroned, and glorified Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one before whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess, and he will summon the rich and the poor, the upright and the downcast, the middle class, the working class, the upper class. The newly crowned monarch will stand before him in judgment. The treble winning coach will be brought to give account the university professor, no exception, no exemption, no exclusion. This is my son. He is the son of man who will come in glory and every knee will bow to him. And those who have trusted him will receive their reward. And those who have rejected him will face his anger. And so the rock, the church, 
God, what is honored, what is at the essence of the character of God. Discipleship, the selfless, suffering, sacrificial service of discipleship. Final judgment. And finally, surely on this particular Sunday, this sad day for us as a church family, that those who have built their house on this rock will be with him in his glory, all sin gone, all suffering removed, all toil and trouble taken away. And that the suffering and trials and terrible tribulations of this life in this broken world, which all of us face, are not in vain. Let me lead us in prayer. He was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Gracious Father, we praise you that it is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ which causes you to delight in him his obedience, his selflessness, his sacrifice, his servant-heartedness. We praise you that this is the key to heaven. We praise you that your church is founded on this reality that you are such a God. We pray that you would help us to understand this, each one of us, so deeply that we ourselves are prepared to take up our cross and follow Jesus in whatever battles we face. And we praise you that we will stand before this Son of Man, your Son, on Judgment Day, and as we trust in him, be found to be without spot or blemish. In Jesus' name, amen.